are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. We can see you. There are some sickies. There are some people here and there that don't feel so good. That aren't feeling really so high. Keep them in your prayer. I'm so glad my mommy is here tonight. Amen. I missed my mommy. Good to see her tonight. That's really great. Hey, I want you to pray for the sick. There are quite a few people that are here and there with symptoms and difficulties and problems of all kinds. Come on in, guys. All come on in, you guys. Christian, come have a seat anywhere you want, man. You sit in the back or the front, man. You can sit up on the platform if you want to. You do whatever you want, okay? But especially right now, I did get a call from Gary and Sarah Black today. Keep all of them in prayer, okay, that God will help them to recover. This is a great crowd tonight. And it's a great crowd because of a number of things. First and foremost, we've got a lot of young people here. And I don't know if you saw them out playing volleyball. Did you guys see them when you came in? It is gorgeous to see the Lord working in people like he is. And I'm grateful for you. You're here with us as well. But I want you to pray about how you can get your family, your friends, people you know. Pray about how God could bring them in. You know what we can do is be praying tonight in our prayer time about how the Lord might reach out and touch people to really install them in First Baptist Church. So let's do that right now before we get started, okay? Father, tonight we desire for you to bring our family to Christ. We desire, Father God, for you to bring great crowds into this auditorium. We desire for people watching online tonight that they would be blessed by what they see. We're desiring that anybody sitting in their car right now outside the building, listening to 9.9 FM, that you, O oh precious Lord, would touch their hearts as they hear this message and hear this music and are drawn unto you. I pray, O oh precious Lord, for people in general in our area. I pray, dear Lord God, that you would work and impact people's lives and hearts. And we'll pray tonight, dear Lord, that you'll give us wisdom as we continue on doing and seeking your will in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, dear ones, stand together. Sing with me this first video in. Shout out for Joel right away. Here we go. Fantastic. Fantastic.
Are they having their college um, class? No. Uh, no. Uh, Dr. Ron said he needed one more week okay. of recovery. Yep. So we will start next Wednesday. Okay, it's another reason we need to pray for the recovery of our church, recovery of those who are sick, recovery of those who are going through difficulties. My mother, with her back difficulties, has had difficulty. I'm grateful she's here tonight. Others with some kinds of pains. I was talking with someone the other day about their arthritis. Roberta, I can't believe how many of us have that. And we're all going through things that just really, I mean, I'll get up in the morning, I can barely move my fingers sometimes. And I don't know what it is about the atmosphere. My father said that there's smoke in the air from Idaho, is that right? California. From California. And that's that's kind of affecting some people. It's affecting stomachs, it's affecting breathing, all that kind of thing. So I didn't know that until just yesterday. And apparently the whole world did, and I did not. Okay, uh, that's fine. Tonight, I want you to pray for Christian, all right, who's here. We're going to be talking with Christian and Dalton just a little bit during the service. I'll tell you a bit later when we get into the prayer service, okay? And I want to just uh, pray the Lord for them. Uh, Brother Christian, I believe it's your grandmother as well, uh, lost their housing, okay? And so keep them in your prayer. I trust you'll continue to pray for the missions conference. When is that? October 17th through the 20th. Very good. Great. Great. I'm so excited about that. And the meeting yesterday was phenomenal. I am excited to show you, look, just the front of the bulletin. And look at this. Uh, those of you who worked yesterday with the bulletin will see a little bit of a difference. Look at this already on the inside. He's getting it done little by little, day by day. He's adding things, adding the missionaries, adding words about the missionaries, adding some about the actual format. And, uh, and then back here also with the faith promise thing. And then Alicia Hale is preaching during the missions. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. She and several others in a good group are going to be helping with decorations and all kinds of things. I know the meals are going to be exciting. We'll be talking to you about how you can prepare to help with those meals as well. October the 12th. Also, there's some great stuff going on. I'll tell you about that later. If you're doing a booth for the carnival, Tommy's going to get a hold of you and talk with you about that. Okay. And then listen, as far as the missions conference itself is concerned, pray about giving a special gift for that. Just pray about it. If God impresses on your heart, well, I think I'll give two or $300 special gift for that. Then what will happen is it will be translated into bigger helps for each of the missionaries during the week that they're here and when they leave. So any of those extra gifts, they'll go directly, you understand, to the missionaries and we're excited about that. Won't you sing with me? Rescue the perishing in 441. In 441. We'll sing together that first very important verse. I love it. Here we go. You ready? Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin. I mean, you know, my father used to say, man, we had 40, we had 50 people in prayer meeting. Look around, man. Amen. Yeah, this is just the adult group, 60, 70 of you here tonight. That's phenomenal. You got me. Praise the Lord. I thank God for you. Sing on that second. Here we go. Go my still be his way.
really do sing well. You really do. And these first two hymns, both of them, you've done so well. On that fourth, here we go. Rest to the perishing, to the man man's strength, for the labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rest to the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Have a seat, if you will. Oh, I shouldn't do this, but i got to point it out. Keith. I love the way you do that. Do what? Merciful G. Oh, I love that. I love that escalation. The escalation is so beautiful. Okay, homeschool co-op. Man, you guys that want to be a part of that, I hope you'll talk with me after the service. We are going to continue to think through that and figure out what we do for gym. We may do martial arts. We may get involved in several crafts and things like that together. I realize you're homeschooling your own children, but sometimes it's nice to be together with other kids and get that cooperation in social times, you know what I'm saying? Pray for more ways to be evangelistic. Pray that God will do that. As you get your prayer lists out, why don't you write down those two needs? First, we need for ourselves to be witnesses to our family, to pray with our family, to get our families regularly in church. Pray that God will bring people to you to invite the church and then also pray for more ways to be evangelistic. Pray for more ways to be evangelistic in your times with the society that we're living in. On October the 12th, Pastor Michael. Where is Pastor Michael? There he is. Raise your hands. Everybody know who the awesome one is. I mean the uh, <laughs> fine gentleman. Pastor Michael. Pastor Michael's training night for discipleship leadership is on October the 12th. And we're going to be doing some training, and then we're going to be handing out materials, and we're going to ask you to decide if you'd like to start working with disciples. Pastor Michael. Is that uh, on a Wednesday? It is. October the 13th. October the 13th is exactly what I didn't say, isn't it? Uh, October the 12th is what I had. I'm so sorry. It's October the 13th then, my dear friends. Yes, that is exactly right. October the 15th will be the Friday for the time when we're doing the carnival. Excellent. Okay, very, very good. Okay, my friends, let's do this. Let's get into our prayer groups tonight, and uh, we'll continue on. As you get your prayer sheet out, I want you to put two things at the top, a couple of things that didn't get put on. James and Barb Rich have been sick. James and Barb Rich have been sick, probably with the same kind of thing that my father has had, which I believe is different from what Gary and Sarah have. Robin's uncle also Elmer Atkins just died yesterday. That's the last of the brothers of her father. And so please pray for Robin. Please pray for uh, Elmer Atkins' family as well in every aspect, if you will. Go ahead and find someone that you might not know so well to pray with. Again, maintain a little bit of a distance, be a little bit careful, but by the same token, I realize that uh, as you're praying, you're sitting down, you spit in the bone quite this far, so that'll be a lot better. Okay, you go right ahead.
like your hymn book, it's in 442, as we continue tonight, in 442, each one, each one. We stand together, if you will, and we'll continue on.
Why don't you talk together later, Dennis, and let me know. But uh, if that'll work better for you, we could change that date from the 25th to the 3rd, because I know that you guys had some things kind of planned, and it might be, what's that? I'm not going to. Oh, well, maybe we'll just stay with the 25th then. How many guys would say, it's better for me on the 25th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday to have that barbecue where you're going to give me a 15-ounce steak? 16-ounce <laughs> steak. Okay, so how many of you guys would say, it would be good at 3 o'clock Saturday the 25th? Raise your hand if you're good with that. Okay, I think 1, so. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, okay, 9. All right, so how many would say the third would be better for me? Let me see. You mean the second? <laughs> yeah, because the third's the Some of you are like, hey, if you're buying, I'm going. All right. Uh, yeah. Hey, you guys come. We're going to have a good time. I'm sure it'll be a good group of people for sure, and we'll really enjoy Let's go ahead and have our offering tonight. Usher, why don't you come forward? Remember, Christian's needs here tonight and the need of his family. If you want to maybe put in a little bit extra for him, put in an envelope or something, mark it on there, and we'll talk about how we might be able to help him. Yes, you may. Go right ahead and have a seat if you'd like. Go ahead and have a seat if you'd like. I'm going to go ahead and pray for the gentlemen that are coming now. Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. We certainly don't deserve all the blessings you've given. I know, Father, that you bless these Christian folk because they've decided to put you first. And as a result of that, the finances that you give to us many times are abundant because of putting you first. And then, Lord, I thank you for a church that opens their books and allows everyone to see what money is being given and where it's going. I wish our government would do that. Oh, God, what a blessing it would be if we had some real honesty in this nation. I thank you for a church that's honest and righteous and does that regularly. I pray you'll bless the people because of that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Guess what we get to do right at the beginning of October? You're not going to believe this. This is really, really cool. I don't think I've ever done this before. We're going to have a wedding for our Sunday night service, October the 30th. Amen. You say, I'm going to get some preaching, some awesome preaching on marriage, on commitment, on love, on the importance of staying together as a family. But Christine and Eric are getting married right here. Woo! That's a real blessing in my heart. They're wanting to make some things right. They want to get right for the Lord. They want to do things that are correct before God. Uh, they have waited in a lot of ways. I know that some of you saw them taking this trip. They slept in different places this last weekend. As you know, they're really trying hard to do what God would have them to do. But I told them, listen, if you want each other, just have each other. Okay? <laughs> Go ahead and get married. And I'm telling you, I think that they waited long enough, and I'm excited for them. Also excited for Sabra and for Eddie. Uh, coming up soon, coming to a church near you. <laughs> very, very excited to see that. October the 3rd wedding reception. We want to talk about that reception. I'd love to have you all involved in maybe doing a potluck that night. Maybe some of you would help with the decorations. You know that Eric and Christine 
are not Rockefellers. You all know that, right? And so let's do what we can to help them out. And the style, I believe, is important. We're looking maybe at some country kind of style, things like that, but we're going to talk together. And some of you ladies, would you do me a favor, ladies? Raise your hand if three or four of you would say, I'll talk to Christine about exactly what she's wanting. So your hand up if that would be you. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, listen. After the service then, your raising of hand was a commitment, okay? So go ahead and talk to Christine about what she's wanting. And ladies, I would be glad to be a part of any of that process that you need me to be, okay? I'm excited about the three strands. That's really neat. They're planning to do what the word says, a three uh, uh, the three-strand cord is not quickly broken. They're going to actually do that in the service. They're going to do a union can. I mean, it's really neat, some of the stuff that they've selected. And we talked some about that right before the service. Next Wednesday, September the 22nd, is Epic Communication Night. How many of you enjoy tonight's intercession time? Man, look at you. God bless you. It was great. 530 Communications next Wednesday night. This has been fun. Because what we do, listen to what we do, okay? On Wednesday nights at 5.30, what we do is we'll take that segment, that one-fourth of the church. Okay, so the first one was, uh, at, what was that? Epic, what is it? Uh, evangelism. The second one was preaching. This one tonight was intercession. And each time what we've done is taken 10 minutes and just done a real quick brainstorm. Boom, 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 boom. And each of the four groups in the group get to do their perfect brainstorm, think about things, write things down, figure things out. This is what we're going to do, ideas and stuff. And then they break up for 15 or 20 minutes, and then they go out and talk together among themselves and come up with exactly how that plan is going to go down. And I'm excited about how the Lord has already blessed in this particular segment of our church. Uh, rehearsal. October the 1st for that wedding. And I hope and pray that you can maybe help me with some of the planning to that. If any of you want to, you got to tell us who you want in the wedding, how you want us to be involved, how you don't want us to be involved. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, let's pray also uh, for prayer sheets themselves. The prayer sheets. As you have your prayer sheets, go through and start considering for all of, we're talking about it tonight, for the, all the intercession people, what things have been answered? What praises we can put on there? What things we can add to the prayer list for Brother Earl's sake so he doesn't have to actually go around and extract that from everybody? Watering also this week. Can I have a few people that say, I'll do some more water? Good, John. Good, good, good. Excellent. You guys do it then. This Sunday the 19th at 5 o'clock, there's a children's workers meeting. Why don't you stand and sing one last hymn with me. Surrender all. Yes, this Sunday night, 5 o'clock, children's workers meeting. Sing with me as we continue this evening. Amen.
Have a seat if you will. Tonight, we start where we're going to end. All right? We start where we're going to end. You say, well, that ought to be a short sermon then, right, Pastor? <laughs> well, actually, no. We're going to do a little sandwich up back here. Second Peter chapter 1, if you will. Second Peter chapter 1. I'm just going to read this verse to you, and then we'll end with the same verse. Second Peter chapter 1. Far is good at giving thee pieces of a story whenever she can. How that works is our family is a fast moving, let's do it, especially during the school year. It's like, bada bing, bada boom, bang, bang. You don't understand? I'm going to see you for a second. I'll see you in a minute. I'll see you a little bit later. We're going to do some work right now in case you're going to be in school. And I'm going out the door because I'm going to the coffee shop, you know? I mean, all kinds of stuff going on in the house. So Barb gives me a little piece of the story here. And whenever she can, she gives me a little piece of something there. And we are busy people, so when we see each other, we tell each other what we can when we can. How many of you know that? Mm-hmm. You guys understand how that works? Amen. The same kind of thing happened with the uh, invention, God's invention, of the Bible. Okay, When he brought it to humans. Now, this book has always existed in heaven. Amen. It's eternal. You understand right. that? But when it came to us, it was done in different ways over a long period of time. We'll talk some about that, but let me just give you this one text, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 to start with. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. You'll see it up on the screen here. It says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private right. interpretation. What does that mean? Well, it means that there's no dude or dudette. That makes the decisions on prophecy. God alone makes the decisions on prophecy. So when pastor gets up and he says, let me tell you what this means, and you know this. Right. I'm going to find the back door and find a church that actually preaches the truth. Because when somebody tries to tell you what the Bible means, they're not telling you what the word says. And there's a difference between telling you what they think it means and what the word actually says. Amen. My goal as a pastor is to take the word of God and make it exposed Amen. to you. Yeah. That's you understand right. that word? Exposed. You know, how many of you have ever seen those crazy people that go down to the river in the middle of the winter and get into the water? They expose themselves to the elements. They're not caged. <laughs> but that's a good illustration for what I'm telling you in exposition. That's what the word is. Amen. Exposition of the word of God. So let me just give this understanding to you. First, giving you the title. How can I know the Bible is absolutely true? How can I know the Bible is is absolutely true. Write that title down, if you will. On the homestead. It's interesting. I'll get up in the morning, and I'll go out to the coffee time shack. And my coffee time shack is situated right in front of the chickens on one side, the chickens in the back, the ducks over here, the rabbits over here, which really don't make an awful lot of noise. But then past there, you'll see the goats, all right? And the goats, I've already told you about some of the sounds they make, you know, and uh, that kind of thing. Some of the sounds that they make, the chickens make, the goats make, it is incredible how the ducks do. And it's interesting how that in the early morning hours, even in the quiet of the dark, you'll hear, (laughs) So you can imagine that in sympathy with, (laughs) <laughs> They're all together doing their thing. That's why I put earplugs in when I'm having this chat. But by the same token, sometimes it's a symphony. And the pieces all fit together in nature. Because you're getting birds outside. You're getting all kinds of sounds. You may even hear the sound of the water over there in the cornfield as they're watering. My friends, nature is beautiful, isn't it? Yes, it is. It fits together. In the same way, God's word was written over a period of between 1,500 and 2,000 years. Now, this isn't something that's debatable. 
Because even among atheists, they have to admit time periods. They have to admit, based on the manuscripts that we have, that yes, these things are this particular age, that particular age, and so on. So let me start. I want to give you three areas that I'd like for you to look at with reference to the Word of God. First of all, I want you to see some extra biblical items related to the Word of God. When I say extra biblical, I just mean that sometimes when you look at the Word of God and you see the evidence of the Word of God, that can make people who are atheists and who don't believe, and even Christians who doubt, they start to think, well, that's circular reason. Because you're using the Bible to prove that the Bible is the Bible, okay? Well, sure, and I understand that. And so some major thoughts related to its inception, or pardon me, its conception. You understand what I mean by that? Okay, so let's start with this. Number one, God's Word being written over that period of time, 1,500 to 2,000 years by 42, uh, give or take one or two. We do understand that sometimes people differ on who they believe Hebrews was written by and that kind of thing. You'll notice in every book, the puzzle pieces fit together. I went and I visited a guy this week. His name is Pepper, okay? Now, I thought that was his first name, because when he came to the door, I said, Hello there, sir. This is my wife, Barbara, and my name is Barry, and I'm the pastor over at First Baptist Church, and I just was here to ask you how you're doing, and to ask you uh, if you are 100% sure that if you die today, if you go to heaven. So what is your name, sir? He said, my name is Pepper, he said. I thought, well, Dr. Pepper's right here. In the flesh, Dr. Pepper. So Pepper takes us into his home. He's telling us about, he actually says he's coming Sunday. I'm excited about that. But Pepper apparently is a Christian. He gave us a testimony of salvation that sounded reasonably close to what the Word of God says. I believe it actually is, but I think that he was trying to sometimes, you know, concepts are different from what you're used to hearing. And so I do believe he's probably saved. But Pepper showed me his puzzles. This man puts together puzzles in his retirement for a living. I mean, I guess that's what you'd say. I mean, it's just like, that's his whole life. You'd say, well, it's not his living because he's not selling them. I don't know, okay? They're pretty cool pictures, that's for sure. In fact, he's got one with nothing but lines. <laughs> like a thousand color... A thousand uh, uh, puzzle piece thing, black and white, with just lines going like this. I just was like, man, a lie. How did he put that together? He said, it took me three months to put that together. Wow. So he said, well, this right here, he had about a stack of 10 or 12 of them. He said, this right here is just a few of them. He said, let me show you the real stack. He pulled us to the back. He had 150 puzzles, a thousand pieces a piece wow. done and put it out and glued together. 150,000 pieces of puzzle. Now, I got to thinking about that, and I thought, that right there is the Bible, okay? So when someone says to me, in ignorance, oh, the Bible was written by a bunch of different people, and it's been changed over and over again, I think of the billions of pieces that the Bible is put together with, and the glue that it's put together with. And I think that poor individual just doesn't get it. Because if you go back and study, I mean, you can Google this stuff. It's not hidden. No one can debate the fact that 5,600 manuscripts and 64,000 fragments of various manuscripts around the world have been discovered. And I'm going to tell you something. Some of those manuscripts, it's amazing to me. They all fit together perfectly like a puzzle piece. But some of those manuscripts, some of those pieces, you compare with one with the other. It is incredible. Now listen. Granted, some people made copies of copies so that they could change the Bible. And I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I'm not going to try to get too deep here. But when you grab a hold of a container that says, contains real juice, you're like, uh, Where's the Welch's? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I want the container that says this is real juice, okay? 
I don't want somebody telling me this contains 10% real chicks, okay? So what we're looking for is Antiochian scripture, all right? What you want is King James scripture. Why? Hey, well, because man. from that point, yep. you're able to find truth, okay? It opens your mind to things that perhaps you've never thought of before. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Asking about the Bible's veracity truthfully mm -hmm. means we need to ask what is true. Yeah. What substantively is true. Mm -hmm. So the Bible makes some huge claims, like John 14 and verse 6. Why don't we put that up? John 14 and verse 6. Mm -hmm. uh, someone just read that for me. Someone uh, raise your hand and say, I'll read that out loud. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Do it real loud, Josh. Go ahead. So how can he make a statement like that? How in the scriptures can you see that and believe it and say for sure, this is truth? Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful verse. Yeah. But maybe there are other ways to heaven. Have you thought about that? I'm sure plenty of us have. Even after our salvation, we may have wondered, is this book true? So how can we extra biblically study it? In other words, Look at evidences that are actually in it and learn for a fact some things that help us to take it as truth. Okay, well, the first thing that I'd like to just say to you is this. If I came down here and I said to Christian, Christian, the turkey is black, but it has a blue nose in the middle of its face. Can you repeat that? The turkey is black, but it has a blue nose in the middle of its face. Blue nose, blue nose in the middle of the face. Okay. So you were to say that in a whisper to your friend here, or even write it down, and then have him write it down. I'm guaranteeing you by the time it got to the back of this auditorium, it would say, the chicken is white, and it has a red face on the other side of its body. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's the kind of thing that you get after just that much. Now listen to me. If thousands of years can go by and 5,600 manuscripts can say exactly the same thing, mm -hmm. right. you yeah. really have to stretch to believe it's not a miracle. That's right. Just that alone helps me a great deal and has over the years as I've studied the manuscripts and looked at what we have. Now, we don't have the originals. But incredibly, we do have plenty that were copies of copies of copies and continue to be copied, you understand? And this is by hand, my friends. We do realize the printing press didn't come to be until less than 600 years ago. We do realize that, right? Mm -hmm. And so for these things to be happening is a miracle. So number, no, number one, we have copies in the second part. We have copies of the Antiochian scripture, which we call the received text. It is neither oldest, nor is it the prettiest. Instead, it is proven to be the most accurate. Proven to be the most accurate, comparably speaking, one with another, comparing and comparing and comparing. How in the world do all these thousands of manuscripts say the exact same thing? You say, Pastor, prove it. You're going to have to look up some of this and prove it for yourself. But what I'm telling you is accurate. It is proven to be the most accurate. You say, now, Pastor, why is it the most accurate? Well, I know a guy named Oscar, okay, who works on cars. <laughs> if I were to go over to Oscar's shop, and I would just say to him, now, Oscar, tell me where your tools are. And Oscar said, okay, let me show you where my tools are. And he takes me over this big wall of tools, all right? I don't know how you got it set up. It's a wall or maybe whatever. I don't know. I don't know. But I don't think that's probably how you operate. But in any case, he's probably got this grouping of tools somewhere. Now, Oscar, what I would do is I would come in there and I'd look at those tools and I'd say, ah, that one. You know how I would know what the best of those tools are? The most used. The most used. Now, I'm going to tell you this, and it's simple. 
When you get manuscripts that are used and used and used and broken all to pieces and obviously needing to be rewritten and rewritten and rewritten because of the use, because of the use, because of the use, you got the Antiochian scripture. You know why? Because all the rest of them are new. <laughs> they were put off into a cave somewhere and ready to be burned. Do you understand right. what I'm saying? That's right. Yes, so when are. you look at these other kinds, these other strains of Greek and Hebrew and some in Aramaic, I got news for you. You don't want to look at that garbage. You want to look at King James writ. Right? You want to go with the received text. You want to go with the thing, the tool that's the most used. Do you Amen. understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, very good. So number two, even though people flippantly say the Bible has been changed over and over, the physical manuscripts, you'll have to, again, you'll have to do some work if you're really interested. But the physical manuscripts prove the opposite to be true. The physical manuscripts prove that they have not been changed, that they've been the same for eternity past, yes. that the same things that we find that are thousand-year-old documents, 800-year-old documents, 1,200-year-old documents all say the exact same thing and have never changed. Praise God. So, my friends, don't ever let someone lie to you without then coming back and saying, well, you proved it. <laughs> if you want to tell me that they've been changed over and over again, you prove it. Amen. You see, the burden of proof is on those who make a statement like that. Because you already have the textual evidence. Tell me if you don't understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. Number three, archaeological study Bibles prove to show precise accuracy between the manuscripts. Those 5,663, 64,000 fragments. Okay. And then number four, the coherency and its message from a book to a book are like no other. It is amazing to me that 41, 42 minds could think exactly alike. They can't. <laughs> you can't get two people to think exactly alike. So when you look at the scriptures, you have to come to the conclusion that these 41, 42 were inspired by God to have precise and perfect accuracy, not just in every word, not just in every sentence and paragraph, but in every jot. And teed it. Amen. Amen. Every tittle, every hota, everything comes together. I mean, I'm talking about every little syllable of the words Amen. are exactly yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Your Bible is perfect. Yes, it is. You don't have to think about it twice. Now, you can go study it out. And when I did that as a young person, Mama, I didn't believe it right away. I mean, there were moments that as a child I thought, all right, great, I got saved, yes, I believe in Jesus, but how do I know that all of this book is right? And at 12, and 14, and 16 years old, I started to do in clandestine studies behind mom and dad's back, you know? And by the time I got to college, I realized, you big dummy, they were right. <laughs> so they were right, the King James Bible is right, man. I just got excited, I started thinking, wow, why do I need to think about it anymore, praise the Lord Almighty. So the coherency and its message from author to author is unbelievable. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the New Testament, oh my friends. Number three, so again, let's go through. Number one. In the same way a puzzle piece is put together and the pieces fit, the scripture is put together to make a whole. Do we understand? How many books are there in the Bible? 66. And those 66 books all are what? Unequal? Or are they all the truth? All the truth. Here's what I have as a problem. I've heard this over and over again. Yes, but Proverbs was written by so Solomon. So, you know, Solomon had his problems. Dude, all 41 of them had their problems. Right. Yeah. The Holy Spirit still inspired every book of that Bible. Amen. And every word of it is yeah. right. Amen. Yes, now, I'm not telling you that when they say clearly, this guy's a liar. Let me tell you what he says. To believe a lie. <laughs> but it's still 
inspired writ. Do we understand right. that? Amen. Sure. Amen. Okay, very, very good. So understand, second, I told you first, they fit together as possible. Second, if you're asking about the veracity of the scripture, then you need to ask what truthfulness of the scripture can give you in huge claims. And we gave you four. That just four. Now listen. Keith, how many evidences could you give me of the King James Bible? I mean, we've talked about it. You've just been like, boom, 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 boom. I've been like, wow. I mean, you can blow my mind with this, right? So I'm just giving you four ideas, just basic things, because I've got 25 minutes to put this in. But if you want to sit down with Keith, if you want to sit down with other erudites of the scriptures, others who understand theology, talk with Dr. Bruce Miller. Get with those that know scripture. Talk with Jeff O'Day. They will help you to see the evidences of what I'm giving to you. Okay? Am I saying that right? It is Antioch, isn't it? Yes. Okay. All right. I just want to be sure. But I was thinking, man, am I getting that wrong? Okay, good, good, good. All right, number three. Now, let's look at the Bible itself as evidence. Okay, we've already looked at some very basic ideas for how there's no way it's not going to fit together thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times over and say perfectly the same thing in various stages. Now, let me give you, before I go on to that, just one very simple statement. The Dead Sea Scrolls were uh, discovered in the 80s, I believe. Do you know, Keith? It was the 70s, 80s. Oh, 70s, 80s. Okay. Around the 70s or 80s. And microfists was a big thing back then. And so at Pensacola Christian College, when we were there, they broke out the microfists, man, because they were able to get copies of it on microfists. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you uh, younger people are like, what's that? I use computers now, son. Okay, so, yes. Back then... We had what was a projection system where you could get a little tiny, uh, uh, like a micro piece of a page, uh, you know, a micro uh, picture like a of a page. Negative. Huh? It was like a film negative. It was negative. a film negative. Very good, very good. And so it was a film negative. You used to take that and put it under a. Uh, uh, Alicia's laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not excited about it. It was really neat. That was cutting edge back then. Leave me alone. Pay back. We take, right, Roberta? Stuff was cutting edge. Right? People don't know. Anyway, so anyhow, I'm looking at this awesome cutting edge stuff. And every single word of the Hebrew in the Pentateuch was exactly what I had in my hands. This had just been discovered, what, 15 years previous? And Keith, we were stunned. Even knowing that it would have been perfect, we were still stunned. Still overwhelmed by that. Why? Because when you actually see the evidence of what you're believing all along and hearing people say, it kind of gets into you. Amen. And man, I had a Holy Spirit moment right there. Woo! Thank God Almighty! Look at this confirmation right here! Amen. It was amazing. So, third and last. Let's look at the Bible itself as evidence. There are four things I'd like for you to look at in your scripture that say, basically Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they completely agree with each other, which right. is an amazing thing. Right. Because when you have four people standing on four street corners at different angles seeing the same accident, you usually don't get an accurate account. You know what I'm saying? But here... A perfectly accurate account is given by all four. John 10, verse 35. Look that up. John chapter 10, verse 35. Somebody read it out loud. Raise your hand if you will. John 10 and verse 35. Anybody? Okay, go right ahead, Michaela. Big and loud. Did he call them God, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken? Scripture cannot be what? Broken. Look at this, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. What does the scripture say? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Somebody read that. Just right off the screen, real loud. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. For Jesus Christ, just like all of the prophets, 
affirm that there's no need to erase anything God ever wrote Amen. in the Holy Land. Right. Now, the apocryphal books, other books that go along, quote-unquote, with the Bible, they're just books. That's right. Just like any book that you could get, some of it false, and maybe some of it that's in accord with the Scripture. But guess what? Josh McDowell is not inspired. Okay? Understand that? As much as I love him, Adrian Rogers is not inspired. Okay? Don't get to a point that your favorite preacher is, Ooh, they're inspired to God. Praise the Lord. Ooh, whatever he needs it. Don't you do that. You never have to do that with me. <laughs> you guys know that already. I mean, mistakes I make. Look at Matthew 4 and verse 4. What does the word of God say? Matthew chapter 4 and verse 5. But he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by what? Bread alone. Read it, somebody. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Woo! How many words? Every well, word. every fifth word, right? Dr. Bruce, isn't it every fifth word? Every. No, it's every word. Amen. Amen. Every it, and, yeah. but, it, I, am, all of it. Amen. Amen. Everything the Word of God says is true, my baby. You go, boy. When I was just a, a young fledging about five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was at Freedom Baptist Church and my van got stuck in the ice. We didn't have any room for parking anymore. Does that sound familiar? Anyway, we didn't have any room for parking anymore, so I was parking out on the grass. Earl's like, oh, don't talk about this. And then again, it was icy out. It had snowed. And here was the deal was, I couldn't get out of there. My van just kept spinning its wheels. Uh, and so we had a bunch of guys trying to push it when we work. I remember remembering this right. This guy came out with his truck and he put a strap on my truck, on my van, to pull it out of there. And it just, boom, snapped. You know what I mean? It went, boom, boom. I tell you something, the word of God is never going to do that. That's right. Amen. The word of God is never going to do that. Praise God. Yes. That strap is never going to break. Amen. Yes. It is impossible. Why? It's God fiber. Yes. God fiber. And I'm here to tell you, the King James Version of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation will never be broken. Amen. And in every Amen. language that the Lord has worked through in whatever version that he uses in our language, in Spanish, is the Reina Valera, 1960, a tremendous version of the Word of God. Why? Because it's Antioch in Scripture. Because it's true scripture. It's yes. the text is receptive. It's a received text. It is yes. not just the most popular, most used, and all of that. It is the truth. And I don't have to worry about that. Yes. All the other things Satan is trying to do to get people off track in these yes. other Greek and Hebrew ideals. My friends, garbage, okay? Garbage. Yes. Understand clearly. Your word, the word of God, the one we're using in this church, you can have Faith in what God is doing. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. The Word of God tells us there that the resurrection is important. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Somebody read that for me. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Is it not the right one? Again? How in the world is that possible? My brain is just cheese. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 17. Let's see 2 Corinthians 5 17. Is it 2 Corinthians 5 17? There we go. If any man be in Christ, there you go. He's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Uh, I do want you to know. That all that stuff that's been happening, my messages, there's a reason for that. I'll be glad to talk to you after the service about it. But the Lord is giving my memory back. And so I'm grateful for that. The resurrection. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. My friends, right there gives you this understanding. You are crucified with Christ, but you are risen with Christ. Amen. 
There's nothing greater as far as evidence is concerned in the scripture than the 500 people who saw Jesus alive. Amen. It is incredible to me. And when you go and look at their accounts, both biblical and extra biblical, Josephus is mind blowing. Some of these guys that wrote about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they're just like, we couldn't figure it out. And there's no way that they got to him. There's no way the disciples pulled him out of that tomb. There's no way. The king's seal was on it. The soldiers were there. You know, there's a quad. I'm not talking about a few. You know, you'll see the pictures of these two soldiers that are about teenage size. You know what I'm saying? Standing in front of the tomb. That is not at all what the scripture said. They were told to go and make it secure. And boy, they did it. There was some serious soldier power standing around that tomb. There's no way those disciples will, ah, I'll tell you what, we're going to go with our fishing nets and we're going to fight against the Roman soldiers. Yeah, woo, we got them. You know that didn't happen. Come on, you guys. And then another beautiful thing. His existence in the Old Testament writings is unbelievable. You start looking at Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, studying the very pictures Amen. of the Savior in Genesis and Exodus and Deuteronomy, the law itself, the Leviticus. Oh, for time's sake, it's 805, Lord God help us. Let's look at the prophetic evidence. Write this down and just look at it at home. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Daniel chapter 2, all right? There are three predictions. There are three predictions here about empires, that three empires would come after Daniel's prediction. And I'm telling you something, they knew when he had written, there's no way it's debatable, and he prophesied perfectly how those empires would be, and that was what? In Holy Scripture. And then Isaiah 40, verse 22, you can write that down about the expansion of the heavens. No one knew until 1920 that the stars were actually expanding and that the universe was spreading out. And yet right there in Isaiah 40, verse 22, it says, He spreadeth the earth as a, or pardon me, the, the, the skies, the, the, the stars as a, the universe as a curtain itself. Yeah. Oh, my friends, the word of God is so explicit. It tells us about a sphere in space, Job 26 and verse 10, Job 26 and verse 7. Job talks about it in, the, in, in chapter, what is it? Oh, Isaiah talks about it in uh, Isaiah 40, I believe it is also. Now, he sitteth upon the sphere of the earth. I saw my first yawn, so i got to stop. Okay, God himself, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3. The universe's coherency with God is amazing. Look at it. Colossians 2 and verse 3. Look up Genesis 1 and verses 26 and 27. It defies logic that the Trinity... He said, our, we are making men in our image, our logic. What does it say about us that we actually are able to understand him? That's a miracle. Yeah. It's a miracle. Does it not dawn on us? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 through 17 then very simply says this. The word of God, the Bible itself is what pastors are to use. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else. Not some silly watchtower, not some foolish religious piece of junk, not some crazy nonsensical creed or something that I say. You Just the word yeah. of God. Why? Yes. Because tomorrow when I look at it, it hasn't changed. Amen. 50 years ago, it didn't say anything different. 1,500 years ago, it didn't say anything different. That's right. And my God has given me total security to stand on the rock. Of my salvation. Yeah, the written word of God. God, this in holy writ, and Jesus Christ in flesh. Would you have a would you would you just take a second and bow your head and just think for a moment? Have a second of silence. Think. We end where we started, Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. What does the word of God say? It says this: knowing this first, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not, listen, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. The holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This book just simply outlines three things for your eternal salvation. You do understand 90 to 95% 
of human beings will go to hell. 90 to 95%. How can you be so sure you're part of the fire? You plant your feet on the words of the living God who says if you will accept the fact that you're a sinner, believe Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead, and then repent with all you've got in your heart before me, putting your nose on the floor, however it is that you need to do, get before your God. Yeah. Tell him that you're sorry. Yeah. Love on him with all you've got. And tell him you want him to be your Lord. You're ready to give up every sin, every nonsense, every foolishness. For yes. his cause. That's real salvation. Yes, it is. There's someone here that would say, Oh, Pastor, pray for me. I have not come to a point where Acts 3.17, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins be blotted out. Yes. Have you come to that point? Repent ye therefore, and be converted. Yes. Let your sins be blotted. Would you stand here once today? Those who would pray, those who would plead with God for souls, those who might be workers, those who might be helpers, won't you come? And then anyone that wants to come with these that are coming now, won't you come down this aisle and receive Jesus Christ? Be glad to deal with them, be glad to help you. People are coming. Look, there's a bunch of people up here. You can come too. Come on. Come on up. Anybody up? You need to come? You need to come? You need to come? Anybody? Come. Come on now. Your God's your king. He waits for you. Ah, oh, he loves you. How he loves you. How he loves you. Precious king and mighty savior, I praise you for tonight. Thank you for the honor of being able to hold your word in my hand and know it's real and right and good. I praise you for it. I thank you for it. I lift your name for it. I ask you to give us wisdom as we continue in you. In Jesus' name. Listen, you can stay here as long as you want. You can pray as long as you want. God bless you and have a good night.